Okay, and okay, so maybe this should be, have been the part of a retrocomputing track because it goes as, ba as far back as 1968 uh, when Dijkstra like, sent a memo uh, talking about why GoTo is bad and why we should avoid it. And the memo was then uh, redistributed by Niklas Werf uh, under the name GoTo Consider Harmful. And that's uh, like the original source of the you know, Consider har Harmful phrase. Okay, so uh, what's wrong with the GoTo in the first place? Do you have to get some context? Like you can put it in different ways, but uh, this particular way of putting it is I shamelessly stole from uh, uh, from Nathaniel Smith, uh, who uh, wrote a nice, nice blog post about it. And it goes like this. Like, uh, this is a program in uh, Fullmatic, which is a pre predecessor of COBOL, and it's an unstructured language. So as you see, there are no loops, and nothing. It's, just, like, it's, not, it's not even uh, indented. And you see a lot of jumps there. So you look at a program, and you have no idea like, what's going on. And then you start drawing like, arrows, like um, how the control flow lo looks like. And it looks like this. So you look at it and you have no idea what's going on. So what's wrong with that? You have different like constructs, so like if, uh, for, or whatever, and go to. And some of them are good, some of them are bad. And how, how should we know like which ones are good and which ones are bad? And one thing, uh, one way of thinking about it is, uh, let's say the construct is good if the control flow starts in, in the top and then it ends up in the bottom. And if you look at all those contra constructs, like all of them have, the, have this nice property that it just goes from the top to the bottom. If you do an if block, it can do the if part or the else part, but eventually it will arrive at, in the bottom. And same for a for or function call or just sequential uh, sequence of commands, but not so for goto. For, for goto, it just jumps somewhere and it never returns. It never reaches the, the bottom of the, of the code block. So we like to believe that, that the functions are black boxes. Like we, we call it a function and the function eventually returns. Like nice and then easy, easy to uh, reason about. So if we have a main function, it calls function foo, which then calls function bar, but eventually it will return from bar and return to foo. And it's also nice for, um, for encapsulation because main doesn't have to know that foo calls bar. Because like you change the implementation, it calls something else, you don't care, it still returns back. But try to use a go-to somewhere. And suddenly that's not, that's not, not longer a case. Right? It just somewhere in the nested function, it jumps somewhere else, never to return. And now here we have developer Bob, who's like very cautious, he doesn't use any go-tos, uh, uh, but he happens to use a library written by Alice, who's very cautious as well, she doesn't uh, use any uh, go-tos, but she uses a library written by Colin, who's careless and who uses a go-to. And suddenly, Bob is hurt by that because like DAO inside the dependency tree, just flow, flow, control flow, just somewhere else, and Bob's function, call, function call foo to foo never returns. Like all the assumptions he had about his code are broken. So this is kind of, it's not only like bad design, it's bad design plus plus because it's transitive. Like it, it takes only one dependency in your whole dependency tree and you are screwed. So, so the, what I was the, talking about it was the old kind of go-to that probably not many people here really remember. There were like the big bad go-tos which could jump around uh, the code base like from a function to a different function and you don't see those anymore, right? Uh, so, and, but it's actually not that uh, the long, uh, uh, long ago. When I started programming in 1984, I've got Sinclair's X Spectrum and it had like uh, built-in basic and it actually looks uh, very much like the flowmatic uh, code I've uh, shown before. Uh, there were go-tos all, all around the place and it just uh, jumped around. So uh, you don't see this anymore, but uh, what we have now is this kind of thing. 
uh, domesticated go-to, which uh, <clears throat> can jump only inside a function, right? So that, that's the go-to in C. Like, uh, you can ju jump inside a function, but there's no way to jump out. So it's still bad, but it's, it's at least not transitive, right? So it, uh, the, the, uh, the calling, the, the developer of a nested, nested dependency can really break your workflow. Uh, okay, so um, now that I've like, explained the, the, the whole like, go-to thing like, from 50 years ago, uh, what, what does it have to do with modern programming thing? Uh, and I'm coming from the networking background. I'm an author of ZeroMQ and I've uh, um, made like, several networking libraries. And the, the problem that uh, occurs all the time is how to handle asynchronous calls, basically. Right? So, so th this is what you have on wire. The, the, there's a byte saying that the, the following field is going to be 13 bytes long, and then you have the actual data. And how are you going to process that? So the old school way of doing that was like classic Unix way where you launch the process for each connection and the process will now nice and sequential and you just read this, read that, and that was it. But then people realized that launching a process per connection is probably not a good thing because it's slow and takes a lot, lot of resources. So we have to do better and so the threads were born and well, the interesting thing is about threads is you can't really find, uh, find out like who invented them. The, the, probably the person was uh, too ashamed to actually. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, so what we have to deal with uh, nowadays is uh, this kind of thing. Uh, we have this async function, which looks like a function, but it's not, not really a function because uh, you would expect it to do whatever is inside the block and then return. Uh, as a normal function, but it doesn't. It returns immediately, and then at some later point, the, the async part is, uh, is done. So if you uh, just look at this naively, as if this was a normal function, you would expect uh, it to print one, and then to print three, and then to print five, and four, and two, but actually what you have is one, two, and that, this part is executed three, four, and then five. So it's weird. And yeah. And it gets even worse in JavaScript, where the, basically the, the, those functions are anonymous and nested inside the code. And this looks like a normal st structure code, uh, but it's, uh, it executes in very different ways. So the, the layout of the program has basically nothing to do with the order of execution. Right? So what, what you see here is one, three, five, four, two. Uh, what's printed out is uh, one, two, three, four, five, I guess. Uh, well, okay, the, the other option to, to, to do it in is uh, classic state machines, uh, where, where you remember like what state you are in in a variable. And, well, this is at least explicit about what, what it's doing. So you go, you are in this state, so you switch to a different state, you will launch a async call, and at some later point, the function is called uh, again with the you know, reading done message and the other part of the state machine is executed. But you know, look at this code, like it's terrible. And this is a one, one slide, but if you look at the real implementation, it's like pages and pages of this kind of stuff. No, nobody can really like, grasp it at first sight. So, then enter, Go, enter Golang. So the nice uh, thing about Golang is that it introduced uh, coroutines as a um, you know, as first class citizen. And you are back to the old Unix style programming where, uh, where you basically launch a process for each connection and it's nice and sequential. Except it's not the process, it's a coroutine, which means it's cheap. Like uh, the stack is uh, at the beginning like two kilobytes and the context switch is pretty quick, like 20 nanoseconds or something. So, uh, okay, so uh, it seems that we are done. But uh, what's wrong with the go-to? With go uh, construct, launching of quarantine, quarantine. You see, it kind of looks like the old go because it's, in, in, on one way, it just continues, but in the background, somehow the, the control flow just jumps away to some different function. It is, it's very similar to go in a way. So, and you have the same problem as we had before. 
So uh, once again, Bob launches the coroutine from Alice's uh, library, the which launches a call from Colin's library, and Colin uh, does go and launches a coroutine uh, which is running in background, and uh, the call returns to uh, to Bob's code, and Bob thinks, okay, the the bar thing is done, uh, but there's actually a coroutine running in background, and Bob has no idea. So it's sensitive again. Like, if any of your dependencies uh, launches a coroutine in the background, you have the old problem from 50 years ago with, you know, this vile, bad, big, bad go-to. So, how, uh, how easy is it to fix? So, one would say, uh, okay, let's make, let's make coroutine scoped, right? So, we have a scope, we launch a coroutine, and when we get to the end of the scope, the coroutine will be cancelled, and that's it. Uh, except that, that that doesn't really work, because... Mm, look here, this is the classical code uh, of a networking code. So we have a server which accepts connections, and each connection is handled by a handler, which is a separate coroutine. Uh, but if it was cancelled at the end of the block, uh, well, it would be actually cancelled immediately, and nothing would happen. So that's not good enough. So uh, what we really need is like two diff different kind of scopes. One is like the normal scope, and one is like extend the better scope, uh, which uh, cancels all the uh, coroutines that were around. Uh, that were launched inside it. All right, so uh, this is uh, in C. This is um, this is uh, code using a library that I wrote uh, called Libdale. And basically, you see that the two scopes here. Uh, there is a thing called, called like a bundle. It's a bundle of coroutines. You initialize it. There, in in the while, you launch any uh, any number of coroutines inside it. And uh, once you want to shut down your server or something, you, you jump out of the loop. Here is the break and you close the bundle, and that cancels all the core coroutines. So it's kind of, you see, it's indented, like nicely structured. Uh, so uh, there are several languages that implemented this, like this is in Python, uh, a library called Trio, uh, which does the pretty similar thing, except it's nicer. So you open a thing they call nursery, which is the same as the bundle in the previous example, and uh, yeah, you, you basically do the same thing. Uh, you launch the coroutines, and once you get, get out of the block, of the, the block, all the coroutines are cancelled. So, uh, is that it? Is that, is that easy? So there are still some open problems here. It's, it's, we are not yet there. Like, for example, the, there is a difference between how Libdil handles the, the termination and how Trio uh, the, handles the termination. What Trio does is, uh, you start your nursery, you launch free coroutines, and when you get to end the block, it waits. It waits till all of them are finished, and when they are finished, it just continues. Uh, and uh, if there's an error in any of them, you just uh, write an exception, and when the exception reach, reaches this point, it cancels all the other coroutines, and then, then it continues. Uh, Libdil does it differently, so there you open a bundle, you launch some threads, and at some point you say, close bundle, and at that point the coroutines are closed. So, so the, the difference really is that in this case you have a kind of like main thread which is in control of all other threads. In the other, other case, like all of them are created equal and, <clears throat> and there is no like the controller and the control. So which way is better? It's, it's pretty hard to tell because uh, in the tri trial version, uh, you have this nice error propagation where you throw an error and the error gets to the caller coroutine and, uh, and it bubbles up until it uh, reaches main. Uh, but uh, the problem there is uh, if that happens, th then it kind of looks like that one of the, one of the coroutines can cancel its siblings and uh, even its parents and they be just very like unstructured way of, of doing stuff. So that, that, that's not nice uh, about it. So it would be nice to know like, whether we can uh, combine the two approaches, that we would have nice error handling and kind of nice en en encapsulation where a coroutine cannot cancel its parent. Mm. Okay, so some other problems uh, that are still unsolved or partially solved. Uh, how, would we, uh, how would we handle timeouts? So one way is to do, use something like as a Golang context where you have an object uh, on which you can uh, call like cancel uh, the timeout function and it will, uh, it will cancel after it or you can, you can pass it manually to each function, like who knows what's better. Uh, 
great period. So that, that, that's a hard problem. So for example, you want to shut down your server and you, you say, okay, uh, I am giving you like five seconds to finish uh, whatever stuff you are doing to close the connection decently and then shut down. So we don't have a good story for that. Uh, okay, I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. <laughs> We're uh, out of time, end. unfortunately. Uh, the, yeah. the timer started a bit late. Thanks. <laughs> so thank you very much for the talk.